By the turn of the century, rotary drilling had been around about 60 years. One of the earliest rotaries is described in a patent dated 1844. Robert Bart designed the system which included a rotating bit, hollow drill rods, and a circulating fluid for removing cuttings. By 1900, many wells had been drilled with rotary tools, but these were primitive, usually mule-powered drilling machines. The cable tool rig, first used by Colonel Drake during the 1850s, was still the most popular way to dig a well. But cable tools were limited to shallow wells and solid formations. The problems facing Captain Anthony A. Lucas at his well called Spindle Top, south of Beaumont, Texas, presented new challenges, drilling through extremely soft formations and to a much greater depth. By the summer of 1900, Lucas had developed a rotary rig adapting the elements of the original design to steam power. The Lucas rig was also the first to use mud as a circulating fluid for formation pressure control and the first to incorporate a check valve on the drill string. This was needed to control a kick in the well after the drillers hit a gas pocket. Spindle top was extraordinary. The first steam powered rotary drilling rig, the first use of drilling mud in formation pressure control, and the first gusher in the world. The unparalleled success of the Lucas project demonstrated the great potential of the rotary rig. The techniques and technology developed at Spindletop are still being used today. This is a state-of-the-art modern rotary drilling rig. This machine is directly descended from the Lucas-designed Spindletop rotary. Both were made to crush rock by turning a drill bit. Both used fluid circulation for lifting the cuttings from the hole and disposing of them and both had a system to move and hoist equipment. For the next several minutes, we'll examine the modern deep hole rotary rig and learn how it works. Every part has a specific purpose, and by studying the parts, you can understand the whole. The concept of rotary drilling is that by rotating a drill bit into the ground, a hole is made in a continuous manner with the rock cuttings brought to the surface by a circulating fluid. As the hole is deepened, lengths of pipe are added to the drill string. The concept is simple, but there are a few problems to be worked out. How do you change worn out drill bits? Thousands of feet of steel pipe is a tremendous load. How do you rotate all that weight? Where does the water for the drilling mud come from? How do you get the drill string out of the hole? How's the power generated and transmitted to the operating machinery of the rig? And when you hit a pocket of gas, how do you keep it from rising to the surface and blowing up the rig? In order to better understand the answers to these questions, we'll travel to an actual rig site and watch as a modern deep hole rotary rig is constructed on location. The first piece of equipment to arrive is a bulldozer. The bulldozers are here for preparation on the location. We flatten the land out, get it cleaned up and leveled out to uh, to uh, set a rotary rig on. Right now, they're presently working on uh, the reserve pit. They uh, worked on this location right here for three days, packing it and leveling it. My name is Stan Rao. I'm a drilling foreman for Anadarko Consultants. On this particular well here, we're drilling it for sanguine oil. The reason we decided to come on this location is the rig in the background here has got a good show in a sand that uh, we're interested in. On, a, on the show in that sand there, it showed uh, permeability of the formation where we could possibly retrieve oil and some gas out of the sand itself. Before any equipment is moved on to a uh, well site, there are certain geologic tests that are run. There are records that are uh, looked at. There are many established, well-established fields out there. 
and uh, sometimes they will just drill an offset location, which is a well that is close to one that is producing. Um, they'll determine where the rig is to be drilled by uh, looking at these kinds of records and uh, various uh, geologic uh, information, and then they'll determine exactly where the well is to be drilled. The location will then be prepared, uh, will be leveled, to meet certain specifications that the rig has to have in order to be rigged up properly. My name is Bill Antry. I'm the safety and security manager for NICOR Drilling Company, a Tulsa-based uh, oil well drilling contracting firm. As far as site preparation is concerned, uh, the, certain, uh, the size of the rig is one important characteristic. Uh, uh, a 30,000 foot rig takes up a lot more space than a 10,000 foot rig. Uh, therefore, you need a larger location in order to move cranes around on the location, in order to uh, move your equipment around and have all your equipment uh, ready to be assembled on the location. Basically, the larger the rig, the larger the location needs to be because you have larger volumes of mud coming out. You have, you have to have, a, with a bigger rig, you have to have more water, you have to have more mud, you have to have more of everything. Even though we're about to rig this rig up on a concrete slab, not all rigs are assembled on concrete slabs. But regardless of what kind of materials the rig is rigged up on top of, the location has to be perfectly level in order to be able to have everything aligned properly. Almost every rotary rig must have water to operate. It's used in the rig circulation system to bring the cuttings up out of the hole. Sometimes water is readily available. Other times, securing water is a major problem. At this particular site, the drilling contractor first tried to drill a water well on the site. While they did find water, the quantity was insufficient to meet the needs of the rig. So in order to fulfill the rig's estimated water requirements, a contract was made with the owner of a nearby lake. The water sources, and particularly this area down here, comes from uh, call them watershed lakes, and there's quite a few of them in this area. There's not too much water sand in here. The, the drill a well is not quite feasible in here. You have a few farm ponds in here where you can find water, but the main part is uh, watershed lakes. Once the land at the drill site is leveled and access roads have been constructed, a drilling crew with a small truck-mounted drilling rig comes to actually start the hole. First they dig a hole to about 30 feet, then line it with a hollow steel pipe called conducting pipe. Then they dig out a roughly square hole around the pipe called a cellar. The cellar allows enough room to install the blowout prevention stack, which sits below the rig floor. In addition, two auxiliary holes are drilled to the side of the cellar. One is the mouse hole, the other is the rat hole. Both are used during drilling operations to store lengths of pipe in the kelly during tripping procedures. The substructure is then brought in and placed directly over the cellar. This particular substructure is called a slingshot. It'll be raised to center the rig's mast right over the conducting pipe. Noel Martin is one of two tool pushers for this rig. A tool pusher is in charge of all drilling procedures in the field. First, we have to set the, the uh, sub in over the hole. And uh, they got pads poured for us to set our subs on. Uh, we've set the subs in first, and we put our derrick together and we set it all up on top of the subs and pin it in. This is a Draco slingshot. Your Draco folds down in the sub, it all folds down together. Your sub and derrick and all goes down on the ground together. That way when you get the derrick in the air, it'll all raise up at one time. Rigs are designed so that they can uh, be taken apart, uh, disassembled and assembled quickly. Uh, the reason for this, obviously, is uh, the quicker you can get on the location, the quicker you can be making a uh, hole for your operator. The rig is designed to come apart easily. Components are pinned together. Uh, they fit together uh, with great ease. Uh, the whole thing assembles like a giant erector set. And uh, it uh, is moved on to location by the truckload and uh, is set up by cranes very quickly.
basically the depth of the hole determines the size of the rig. The deeper the hole, the larger the rig. And uh, the larger the rig, the longer it takes to uh, set up a rig from the time it moves onto the location till it's ready to uh, start drilling. It can take as little as one day to set up the rig or as much as seven or eight days. The derrick has come to symbolize the oil industry. Up until 25 years ago, derricks like this dotted the landscape in oil producing areas, marking the locations of drilling and production activities, and reminding those passing through that they were in oil country. The occasional old derrick still found along the back roads is truly a relic. Today, this has replaced the old derrick as the sign of drilling activity. It's a modern portable drilling rig, and like its predecessor, it's the center of all drilling activity. The mast, or derrick as it is still often called, must be capable of supporting the weight of the entire drill string, plus all the other hoisting equipment necessary to drill and complete a well. It must be able to support a tremendous vertical weight. Depending on the individual rig, that can range up to one and a half million pounds, and it must be capable of withstanding horizontal winds of over 100 miles per hour. The mast is central in the operation of the hoisting equipment, which includes the draw works, the crown block, and the traveling block with hook. All these pieces go together to make a giant block and tackle arrangement with the mast supporting the weight. There are four elements to the hoisting equipment. You've got the draw works, which is like a giant winch. And this draw works uh, spools up all of the wire line on it. The second component would be the wire line. Uh, third, you have the crown block, which is a stationary series of pulleys that sits on top of the mast. And the wire line goes from the draw works through the crown block and then is, goes down through the traveling block, which is a block that goes up and down the derrick as the draw works pulls. And then you have lines that are strung back and forth over and over again between the uh, traveling block and the crown block uh, and then it's anchored into the substructure so that as the draw works pulls wraps the line up onto the draw works it will pull the traveling bo block up through the mast raising anything that's hooked onto it and it can handle uh, very heavy loads. The mast is assembled in a horizontal position and at, at that point, the block and hook are attached two lines through the crown to the draw works. The drilling line is threaded through the block and the crown and back and forth through the block and crown several times, and it is then run into the draw works. The wire line is steel cable. Uh, usually an inch and an eighth in diameter, uh, but it can be larger or smaller depending on the depth of the hole. After everything is secured and fastened, then the draw works, the power is applied to the draw works, which in turn makes the mast stand up in a vertical position. And at that time, then the mast is secured and is, uh, is bolted down so that it can remain in a vertical position. And then the uh, hoisting equipment is then used to raise and lower items, uh, usually pipe within the mast and through the uh, rotary table down into the hole. Through animation, the mast of this slingshot drilling rig was raised to the vertical position and its platform elevated in just 37 seconds. In actuality, this process took more than 17 minutes to complete. As we mentioned earlier, the idea behind rotary drilling is that a drill bit is rotated into the earth in order to crumble up the rock and make a hole. The next essential component of the drilling rig is the rotating equipment, which includes those pieces that actually turn the drill pipe and rotate the bit at the bottom of the hole. These are the pieces from the swivel down the hole to the drill bit. 
the swivel is attached to the hook and allows the drill string to rotate. The swivel also performs another very important function as a part of the fluid circulation system, which will be covered later. Immediately below the swivel is a hollow square or hexagonal steel pipe, which extends down through the rig floor. This is called the Kelly. It passes through the Kelly bushing, which is inserted into the rotary table. The rotary table drives the Kelly bushing, which turns the Kelly, which turns the drill string. The Kelly bushing also allows the Kelly to slide downward as the bit turns and the hole deepens. This rig crew is about to make a connection. That means the downward progress of the drill string has reached the point where another piece of drill pipe must be added. The slips are put into the rotary table to support the weight of the spring. The Kelly is unscrewed and is pushed over to the mouse hole where another joint is waiting. It's lowered into that joint. That joint is screwed onto the Kelly. Then it is all hoisted up above the drill string and the hole and screwed back together. It is then hoisted again and the slip removed from the rotary table. And then it's lowered to the bottom of the wheel bore and drilling is started again. I'm Dan Perkins, assistant drilling superintendent for Parker Drilling Company. The joint of pipe is 30 to 31 feet long. Every time you drill 30 to 31 feet, you have to have another joint of pipe in order to proceed into the ground. Going to a depth of 20,000 feet, you might use 640 to 650 joints. Uh, the drill string could weigh, uh, depending on the size of the drill string and the well bore, uh, 250,000 to 400,000 pounds. The drill string is uh, the pipe between the hook and the bottom of the hole, uh, the bit. And this drill string is made up of uh, drill pipe, drill colors, which are very, very heavy, uh, is a very heavy form of pipe, and the drill bit. The drill bit is intended for crushing the rock and making the hole deeper. The drill collars are intended for uh, uh, adding weight to the drill string so that the appropriate amount of weight will be on the bit in order to crush the rock. And the drill pipe is ma there mainly uh, for weight and also for uh, a means of being able to pump drilling fluids down into the hole. The problem with drilling a hole in the ground is that you will encounter various different uh, geological formations where you might have the uh, formation caving in on the bit or you might have your fluid circulating materials uh, being lost into a formation and as a result of that it becomes necessary to uh, line the hole with a kind of pipe which is called casing. This casing is uh, a tubing type situation that the drill pipe w can pass through. Uh, it uh, is cemented into the ground and it is uh, then prevents the walls from caving in or fluids from escaping. As was mentioned earlier, Rotating a drill bit to crumble rock is only part of making a hole. There must be a way of removing the crushed rock, the cuttings, out of the hole. This is accomplished by the rig's fluid circulation system. Drilling fluid is called mud. It's a mixture of clay, weighting material such as pulverized barite, and other chemicals. Mud can be either water or oil based. Drilling mud is an important part of the operation and the exact mixture is a major decision that's constantly changing and subject to many variables. Oftentimes, the tool pusher will bring in a drilling mud specialist, a mud man to help determine the type of mud to use in a given situation. An examination of the parts of the mud system will help to explain the importance of this rig component. These metal tanks are used to store the drilling fluid for circulation through the drill string. They're called the mud pits. A pump is used to move the mud from here up to the standpipe and through the Kelly hose. 
the Kelly hose is inserted into the swivel, which allows the mud to pass into the Kelly, down through the drill pipe, and out the drill bit at the bottom of the hole. Due to the constant pressure of the pump, the circulating mud is forced back up the annular space between the drill string and the sides of the hole. As it comes to the surface, it brings the cuttings up with it. The mud, now carrying the suspended cuttings and possibly some gases, is channeled first through the blowout prevention stack. Occasionally, you'll have a hole condition that's uh, termed a blowout. And what that is, is when the gas pressures uh, unexpectedly begin to come out of the hole. And when that occurs, it'll take all of the fluids that are in the hole out with it and blow them out of the hole. It could blow pipe out of the hole. And in order to prevent this from happening, there's a system called a blowout prevention system. Sometimes it's referred to as the BOP system. And the blowout prevention system is basically a series of valves, large, very large valves, that can close either around drill pipe or flat against themselves, and which will shut off the flow of gas. After passing through the blowout preventer, the circulating fluid goes into a mud gas separator where any dissolved gases are removed and burned. Next, the mud passes over a shale shaker that sifts out the cuttings and then into a pit and finally to storage in the premix pit. While these are called pits, as you can see, they're actually large metal storage tanks. The only true pit on location is the reserve pit that's used for excess water and waste. Besides cooling and lubricating the bit and carrying cuttings to the surface, the drilling mud also uh, has a purpose of helping to control some of the downhole uh, conditions that can arise. Uh, sometimes you'll have lost circulation, which means that the uh, uh, fluid is escaping into a cavern or a porous formation down below, and you might want to then modify the mud to, to go down and plug up that hole. Uh, sometimes uh, the hole will cave in on you and the mud will offset uh, holding the formation together. And uh, it's very important in the blowout prevention aspect in that if you can get your mud to a heavy enough weight, it can offset uh, the pressure that is coming up from the bottom of the hole. The mud viscosity should be controlled to give you the most efficient hole cleaning capabilities. Uh, should it be too thin, if the mud was too thin, you wouldn't have a carrying efficiency to bring the cutting from the bottom of the wellboard to the surface. You should have a happy medium there. If you go into too thick of a mud, it will affect your penetration rate in drilling the well. Penetration is how long it takes to drill a foot. Uh, it's the amount of time that the drill bit actually takes to penetrate a foot of the, the well bore. Normally you have a mud engineer come out every day and check all the properties of the mud and make recommendations. Uh, during the rest of the time, the Derrick man on the drilling rig will check the mud probably every hour and uh, follow the procedures left on a, a program left by the mud engineer and maintain the mud as specified. Nearly all rotary drilling rigs are powered by either mechanical or electrical means. Normally, internal combustion engines, usually diesel engines, supply the primary power. With mechanically powered rigs, engine power is delivered to various parts of the rig through gears, pulleys, and the like. But most rotary drilling rigs use a diesel electric power system. Electric generators, powered by diesel engines, transmit power through electrical lines to the rig's draw works, mud pumps, the rotary table, and anywhere else power is needed. When it's cheaper to buy electricity from a power company than to fuel the diesels, the engines are bypassed. Drilling for oil and gas is not as simple as adding pipe to the drill string. Many times during a drilling operation, everything stops and the entire drill string is lifted from the hole and disassembled. Making a trip, pulling the drill string from the hole and putting it back again, can take the better part of a day, particularly in deep holes. Most commonly, crews trip for a bit. That is, they trip to replace a worn bit. They pull the drill string from the hole, unscrew the old bit, 
put on a new one, and trip back into the hole. Bit selection varies according to many factors, such as depth, formations to be encountered, and other considerations. That makes bit selection very important. But there are other reasons for tripping than just to replace a bit. Any problem down hole will almost always result in a round trip. Besides uh, replacing a bit, uh, sometimes a uh, trip is made uh, for retrieving lost tools in the hole, uh, for retrieving a wrench that might have been dropped in the hole. This is called fishing. A uh, cone might be twisted off or pipe might be broken uh, and have fallen to the bottom of the hole. Uh, in order to retrieve these kinds of items, a trip must be made with various special tools to retrieve these items. Um, a trip is also uh, made when you're putting your casing into the hole and for uh, loosening stuck pipe. In making trips and drilling a well, you have to make so many trips because a bit will only, the bit life will only be so long, depending on how you run it and the type of formation that you're drilling. And when a bit becomes worn or dull, you have to make a trip to replace it. A trip is just part of drilling a well. Uh, you can't drill a well without making trips. This videotape has described the basic components of the deep hole rotary rig as the hoisting equipment, the rotary equipment, and the circulation system. The final component that makes all this work is the rig crew. While the size of the crew varies depending on requirements of the job, most land rigs have a crew of four or five men on duty working eight or 12 hour shifts called towers making whole around the clock. The basic responsibilities of the members of the drilling crews are to uh, help to make connections, to add drill pipe uh, to the drilling string, to change the bit by the means of making a trip. Their main responsibility is to take care of these functions and uh, to be able to coordinate their efforts together to work as a team. For the crews, uh perform more, the most efficient way they have to work as a team. It's basically teamwork. They have to know what to do and when to do it, and uh, they really have to know what everybody else is doing. The tool pusher and driller supervise the connection. The driller will raise and lower the traveling block. The rotary helpers or roughnecks will disconnect the pipe and help handle it across the floor and the derrick man will be stationed on the monkey board 85 feet up in the mast to rack the drill pipe once it's pulled from the hole. There are uh, uh, certain positions that have some specific responsibilities. First, we start out with the floor hand. His responsibility is to catch the samples of the cutting materials that come up uh, with the drilling fluid so that the uh, geologists uh, can determine uh, exactly what formations they're drilling through and what they might be able to expect uh, as they proceed on in the drilling operation. The motor man, uh, his main response, one of his main responsibilities other than the uh, actual drilling operation itself is to uh, maintain proper uh, fluid levels as far as uh, lubrication is concerned and the engines and the motors and to watch the motors uh, keep them running properly and, and maintain them properly. Uh, the derrick man has a special responsibility in the uh, uh, tripping operation and in uh, some of the other operations where he has a responsibility to be in the mast to help manipulate pipe uh, and also he has a responsibility to keep the crown and block greased uh, to where they can function uh, and maintain them properly. The derrick man also uh, has a responsibility for keeping the mud system uh, at, at the appropriate predetermined levels uh, to keep the viscosity uh, in the ranges that it's been predetermined to be at and to keep the weight of the mud appropriate for the whole conditions. The driller is the foreman of the crew. Uh, he supervises the uh, derrick man, the motor man, and the floor hand. 
He is also responsible for uh, maintaining the proper RPMs on the engines, uh, the proper uh, rotating speed for the uh, rotary table, to keep the pumps at the appropriate uh, pressure levels, and to raise and lower the hoisting equipment on the rig. The driller reports directly to the tool pusher, who is management's representative on the drilling rig and supervises the whole drilling operation. The tool pusher has to have a great deal of experience to be able to uh, perform in his job. Normally the tool pusher has worked his way up through the ranks. He's worked as a floor hand, a motor man, a derrick man, and as a driller. The tool pusher has uh, the responsibility for overseeing the maintenance of the engines, overseeing the drilling operations, and for basically keeping the drilling operation moving at the pace that it should be moving. The tool pusher is the number one man on the rig. The drilling operation is completed when the previously arranged total depth is reached. At that point, the parties that contracted the drilling operation uh, have to make a decision whether or not they will produce uh, at any formations. And in order to make that decision, they have to, uh, dis to run various tests to uh, be able to decide whether or not there's enough gas or oil uh, down hole to make it worthwhile for them to produce it. This videotape has actually just touched on the basics of rotary drilling. It's nearly impossible to learn all the details of drilling for hydrocarbons by reading books or watching videos. The process of drilling a well has been and continues to be a dynamic process. New technology and new equipment will continue to develop as new areas are explored and deeper wells are drilled. Once the well has been drilled, a new set of problems, decisions, and procedures come into play in the completion of the well. Future Penwell video programs will review these complex topics. The drilling operation is an expensive operation. It's a time-consuming operation and it's very risky. When you reach the total depth, it's not always apparent whether or not you have uh, any kind of a show in any formation, uh, whether or not there may be gas or oil. And uh, if there is any gas or oil to be found, sometimes it's not in the proportions that make the production of it economically feasible. In spite of the risk, the drilling operation is a challenging and rewarding experience, and there's no feeling like the one that you get when you know that you've been part of a successful search for oil and gas.